All right, everybody. Well, welcome to Live from My Drum Room. It's a pleasure to see you all today. And uh, I'm very excited about today's guest. Really a treat. So please welcome my guest today, author of Charlie's Good Tonight, the biography on Charlie Watts. Please welcome Paul Sexton. Hello, John. Hi, Paul. Nice to see you, man. Good to see you, man. Uh, thank you for being here today. Pleasure to Great have pleasure. you. Great pleasure. Uh, especially as we had such a lovely conversation uh, for the book. To which oh. uh, anyone who doesn't know, John was a, a great contributor. Thank you very much. And I, I you, you, uh, you know, you kind of beat me to it. I was going to thank you again uh, for including me. It was, I, I know you know this about me, Paul. We talked a lot about this, how much of a, a fan I, I am of Charlie's and, you know, you know, I, I can call myself his friend and, and it was such a huge honor to talk to you and to be in this Great, great book. Um, so I thank you so much for that. Well, it's a great pleasure. You know, it's just one of so many lovely conversations that uh, that I had in, in obviously very sad, sad circumstances. But um, it, it it was amazing to um, to, just to to see the the, the warmth and the, the the depth of people's feelings towards this this guy that we all yeah. loved. I remember the day we spoke, and and uh, you said something like. Um, you know, I, it was, I, it was so sweet. You said, not surprising. Um, there's been, no one said anything bad about Charlie. No. You know, there's, there's, <laughs> it's going to be, and I think you said it's going to be something like, you know, the, the most drama free yes. book because it, it's just all good. And of course, yeah. w what else would it be? You well, know? that's right. Yeah. I mean, that was one of the early conversations I had with the publishers. I said, you know, there won't be any scandal at all in this, don't you? <laughs> um, <laughs> and you know, even the, uh, the, the little, you know, that unfortunate, um, the, the 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 sort of period where Charlie did go a little bit off the rails, as we know, in the eighties. Um, but that was all known about before, and he was very open about it, of course. And so there was nothing, yeah. nothing new or surprising there. But um, no, what I, it it turned out to be just, um, you know, I think a nice opportunity for people to 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 pay their respects to him. I, I hope not in a bland way, but um, you know, there's there's just so many warm stories, yours and and so many others, and and from the his bandmates as well, of course, which is just. Lovely, you know. Yeah, yeah. I and I, I wanted to mention that too. That, you know, for anyone who hasn't read this book yet, you, I, you know, I don't know what you're waiting for. It's a <laughs> fabulous book, and I can say that completely unbiased. I mean, it's if I hadn't met you, Paul, I'd have rushed out and and bought this book regardless. Well, that's great uh, to hear. Because it's, yeah, it's so great, and it's so, um, you know, it's. I think I can use the term bittersweet because it's, it's, it's uplifting, and it, you know, there's so many places in the book where I'm, I'm like laughing out loud at things that people say, or that Charlie said. Um, it's, and at the same time, you know, the reality that he's, that he's not with us, but yeah, that's right. I mean, um, that, that is the only sad thing is that, you know, you, you know, what happens, you know, that's the thing with it, with it. We, yeah. you know, we know the ending, but um, a friend of mine was sweet enough to say that, uh, you know, he, he enjoyed it, enjoyed it like a novel, you know, as, as if, um, you know, as in a book that he didn't didn't want to end. You know, as he as he yeah. sensed it getting towards the inevitable conclusion. You know, that's exactly how I felt. You know, every time as I got closer and closer to the end, it was one of those things where I'm like, ah, oh, I don't. You know, I mm. really don't want this to end. You know, um, yeah. and and I, I love. You know, I think what's great about this book is the history that you had with Charlie mm -hmm. um, personally. That that you were able, you had all this acts into the band. Yeah. And again, I'll say to anyone who hasn't read this book, it's as it's as great for Rolling Stones fans as it is for Charlie fans because there's so much of the rest of the band in here. Yeah. That they generously gave you their their time and 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 uh, contribute you know contributed to it. Yeah. But you could you could tell I could tell that you and and Charlie had a great rapport you know and and the way that he opened up to you and the things that. Yeah, you have in there. I, I I think so. Yeah, and it's one of those. I mean, I'm sure you found the same. Um, you know, it it took a while <laughs> um, <laughs> to reach that 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 stage, um, and I think that's inevitable. Doing what I do for a living, you know, um, bands, especially you know, mega successful bands, are just inevitably wary of people like us. You know. Um, because a band like the Stones has just been, you know, frankly, um, and to put it bluntly, they've kind of been screwed by everyone, really, at one, you know, yeah. in media terms, at some stage or another. So you have to kind of spend an awful lot of time pro proving yourself. Um, 
to, to them. And um, yeah, I mean, I guess I, I managed to, to, to do that to some extent, you know, quite a long time ago. Um, I first met Charlie in 1991. So, uh, and I think we probably, we, we, I, I kind of lost count, but you know, when I was kind of um, documenting everything in preparation for the book, I, I counted a good dozen um, interviews with, with him. Um, and of course, you know, that's in addition to all of the, the, the dozens more interviews with, with the, the rest of the band um, over all of that period and still continuing to to this day. So there is, um, in addition to the, all the new conversations for the book, um, you know, there is an awful lot of the archive in there as well, which you're right. It was it was lovely to have that to draw on um, and to be yeah. able to add to it with these, uh, you know, very up to date um, observations of, of him once he'd gone. Yeah, exactly. It was, it, it was, it, I think it all fit perfectly where um, rather than only relying on, you know, anecdotal type um, comments from, from his bandmates and friends mm -hmm. and family, you know, you had actual conversations with Charlie that you could put in there that, um, yeah. it, it, you know, it's so well done. And, yeah. I mean, I spent a lot of time doing, um, you know, the, the, in addition to all of those things, there's um, quite, I drew quite a lot on, on our, our other archive interviews, especially from the early days, you know, um, while they were still doing them, of course, you know, I mean, in later years, they were not talking to the press anywhere near as much, but certainly through the sixties, um, there are some wonderful and, and often unintentionally hilarious interviews that Charlie gave to, to the <laughs> weekly music press. And of course, you know, this is one of the great differences between um, the, 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 our, our two countries is that, you know, in the UK, the, the music press was always so important. Um, mm. And it's, it's my starting point as well. You know, that's how I kind of came through as a, as a writer was, um, was writing for one of those week, uh, weekly music papers. And, um, you know, journalists in those days I'm, I'm i think whenever you start in this game you're envious of the people who were there before you <laughs> uh, and i have a lot of people now <laughs> younger people now who are like oh man i can't believe you you got to do what you did and the people you met but then i look back on some of those interviews that people or the access that people had in the 60s especially um and sure, then, you know there's yeah. only a few key writers really and they they really did get to know these you know their, their subjects extremely well and go to their houses and so on i've done that too but it's um you know it is one of those things that you have to really sort of um, as I say, prove yourself that you're um, kind of a little, a little different from some other <laughs> journalists, maybe. <laughs> yeah, you know, with with me and Charlie, it's interesting. I, uh, I I guess I sort of did prove myself, but it was probably a little easier because at the time I was working for Zildjian, and mm -hmm. I came bearing gifts. You know, yep. I I came bearing symbols, and <laughs> my first foray into into sort of the introduction was uh, sending him some really rare old vintage symbols from the 1940s that we had found yeah. and through Chooch McGee, um, you know, Chooch rest his soul. He, he, you know, much like Don McCauley, I think Don is the perfect guy. Mm. I, you know, I love Don and he's, yeah. he, he reminds me of Chooch and his mannerisms and the way he handles things. And, but I went to Chooch and I, and I introduced myself and I said, I have these symbols. And he said, well, you know, write a letter and and send it to me they were recording at ocean way this is mm. 1997 and um he said i'll 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 bring the letter to charlie and then we'll see where it goes and so i i wrote the letter i sent it federal express mm -hmm. and uh i then i left for a trip for like a two-week trip uh business trip and then a couple of days into the trip i called to get my voicemail and there was charlie on my voicemail <laughs> saying you know this i, I still have the, the message i good, managed to good. save it yeah. And it's, you know, my name's Charlie Watts. I got a letter from you via Cheech McGee. Um, I'd love to try, try these new, these old symbols out, you know, and then he left this detailed message about what he, what he's looking for. And then, you know, I did finally meet him a couple of months later. Yeah. And, um, and I, and I do remember he was, he was not guarded, but Cheech introduced me and he was very cordial and, mm. and, and polite as he is. And then, he came back later to check on me. It was at a sound check at, uh, at, at giant stadium. And, um, and he came back and, you know, you all right. And I said, yeah, great. Thank you. You know, it's mm. great, great to be here. And then we talked a little bit more and they were coming to Boston. And I said, you know, there's a jazz show happening the night before your first Boston show, mm. uh, with this great tenor player, Joshua Redman and his drummer is a friend of mine. And, 
And in, long story short is Charlie and Chooch came to the gig yeah. the night before at this jazz club. And that really kind of, I think I passed whatever test there yeah. might have been at that point. Yes, yeah. that's right. I think yeah. perhaps a little a little easier because, you know, inevitably um, my situation was always um, more formal because, you know, he was essentially being wheeled out for the interviews that he never wanted to do. <laughs> yes. So yeah, yeah, started, yeah. You started from a disadvantage <laughs> because he just would rather be anywhere else you know, than in that room. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, it, 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 <laughs> over a long period of time, um, it, that that definitely improved. And, I, you know, I could tell we were getting on well. And um, of course, the trick was always to try and, you know, d- get what you needed about the new Stones album or tour or whatever, which he would just do under under protest, really. And then just <laughs> just divert the conversation into jazz and then you're fine. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but may... Well, you know, yeah, I was just going to say, knowing you how I, you know, the the way I do, I, I have to imagine that it didn't take long for him to really warm up to you that he, you know, I mean, I, what, what you see is what you get, you know, you're, you're not, <laughs> well, that's you know, very kind. It, I mean, he, it, it's interesting. Actually, when I was doing the book, because Charlie's not one of those, uh, as you know, I mean, he's a, just just about the, the most, I would say the most undemonstrative person you could, you know, possibly imagine, just full of that classic English reserve. Um, yeah. And um, so we certainly never had a conversation along those lines. You know, I think it's just one of those things where you kind of figure with all of them, actually, you think, well, I'm getting asked back again. You know, one once so yeah. clearly uh, I, you kind of take the compliment from from that. Um but it wasn't until I was actually writing the book and after he'd gone that I found out actually from Don, uh, you know, who was, again, like yourself, was was a terrific help, you know, and and, and so um, uh, generous with his time and, and information. Um, and he yeah. he he did say that um, apparently I was I was one of the one of the all right ones, <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> and he. Yeah, I have to think so. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, he I, I think that's the thing he with it with. Few exceptions, I think. By the time he got into the, you know, that run of making um, records in his own name, you know, the the the, the big sequence of of, of jazz uh, releases, um, interviews on that on that subject were, were fine. Um, but it's one of the things that I think people have found rather surprising about Charlie, who didn't know him um, through the book, is is really quite how much he um, di- didn't didn't buy into anything to do with the world of rock and roll. You know, and uh, in mm-hmm. addition to which, he would never really listen to a Stones track unless he absolutely had to, or to approve a mix or something like that. You know, or, a, right. or maybe one of the reissues. Um, he would always say to me that you know the only time he actually enjoyed that side of it was when they were actually in the studio creating the thing. You know, he loved that, but yeah. he would never. This happened so many times with interviews because I I would normally be seeing them when you know the new album's about to be released or often I'd go to you know go and visit them in in rehearsals in in, in Toronto a few times and and elsewhere um, and uh, you of course you've got to, you've got to start by talking about the new stuff you know and then maybe you're going to work it back into into a bit more history or other other subjects um, but you'd sort of say to him you know well, that that lead track on Bridge to Babylon is really great isn't it he said I don't know. Don't know because <laughs> he hadn't listened. To it. <laughs> you go, <"Is> yeah. It? <laughs> I, oh, I know, and you know, uh, and I'll tell you too from a personal standpoint. I would, I, I think he he realized that when I would come, you know, the conversations that we had when we interacted, it was not for really any business corporate it was really a personal i was i think he realized truly how much of a fan i was and i really tried to keep that in check paul i tried to not geek out too much but but you know i would ask him questions about especially after i left sildjian like in the last 10 years we really got into some some deep conversations at a gig and i'd ask about do you remember the you know the snare drum you used on this track you know and you can picture that look on his face he'd go (laughs) oh god i (laughs) I don't know. I said, do you think maybe it was the Gretsch, you know, metal snare? Mm -hmm. Might have been, you know. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah. that's right. Yeah. 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 If you'd been talking about, you know, the the, the snare on one of his favorite records by one of his jazz heroes, you you would have got it straight away, of course, you know. Right. Yeah. Yeah, of course. I know. But he, um, I know, I know he was, and, you know, people might think that that was sort of put on, you know, that, that. It's just the way, you know, some people might put, oh, I, I don't remember that. It was so, you know, mm. but he really didn't because I think he, I don't know. He was just so, uh, I, I don't know. I want to say it so it doesn't sound unflattering, mm. but I think he felt that what he did was not really that 
important no. or 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 uh, significant, I think. Yeah, that's right. I mean, so you humble. Know, there's that phrase that you hear a lot these days, which is imposter syndrome. And I, I don't I don't think it was quite that. You know, he um, he would often denigrate himself, you know, he, in terms of his in terms of his drumming abilities you know yeah. he, he would always talk himself down it was almost impossible to pay him a compliment i found you know because he would just swat it away you know um yeah but at the same time i don't think I, I never interpreted that as a lack of of confidence i think he you know he he had that he he knew who he was for sure mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. he just didn't choose to go on about it the way that most people in this game do yeah. you know and that's what made him stand out so much yeah Absolutely. I, I think you're right. I think it's, it's just pure humility. Mm. You know, it wasn't like you said, it wasn't a confidence thing. It was just him being very sincerely yeah. humble about what he did. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I mean, the number of times, you know, I, I've never had a conversation with Keith, in which he has not just almost sounded in awe of Charlie, you know, and just repeatedly yeah. told me how lucky he has been to, to be in a band with with this guy. Um, and I do remember one occasion I sort of relayed some of that to Charlie, you know, and I said, so, I think I actually, it was a radio, radio program I was making for the BBC, one of many on the stones, um, in which I actually talked to each of them about the others. So it was called the stones by the stones, you know, and it was like each of them talking about the other three. Um, <laughs> and so for the purposes of that, I said to Charlie, um, Keith thinks you're wonderful. And he went, really? When did you last talk to him? <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, forget uh, it. You, just, you just couldn't, you had no chance. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I know, I know. And I, I do want to, I, I want to give a shout out. She could even be watching today because we are live. Um, thank Nettie Baker, yes, daughter of Ginger Baker, who was the actual connector between you and I. And I, yeah, and absolutely. I saw, hi, Nettie, if you're out there, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, hi, Nettie. Thank you again. <laughs> yeah, she's she's a sweetheart. And, absolutely. Yeah, and I'm, she's another yeah. great help. Um, you know, and and really important because that relationship between um between her dad Ginger and and Charlie was uh, was you know really was a lifelong friendship. Yeah, you know? yeah, and you know I didn't realize it, Paul, until um you know, you talk about it in the book, the tribute we did when I was at Zildjian for, to Ginger Baker. Mm. And that was in 2008. And I think it was only leading up a year or two before that, when we started planning it, that I realized how I knew they knew each other, mm. Charlie and Ginger, and I knew they were friendly, but I didn't realize how deep their friendship yeah. was and how far, how far back it went. That's right. I mean, I think and, they met in, yeah. uh, in 1959, I believe, you know, and, um, yeah. uh, may well have been at the Troubadour, you know, the, the club in Hell's Court. Um, so it's it, it's really you know not long after Charlie has started um, getting on the circuit kind of thing you know and playing as he did you know was there's a, that wonderful photograph we had a lot of exclusive photos in the book but one of the one of them that had been seen before is that terrific photo of him and his lifelong other other lifelong friend Dave Green uh, the, the yes lovely man and a, and a great double uh, bass player um, they're playing in a in a pub in uh, in Ealing in in North London and uh, I think Charlie's 18 at that point so it's, it's right around that time uh, yeah you know late 50s and he's looking wow. not only I'm sure playing the part but absolutely looking the part as well looking yes incredibly dapper you know yeah exactly exactly you know I, I've met Dave a couple of times mm. and you mentioned in the book um Dave mentions uh, is talking about Steve Gadd coming to see Charlie yeah. and I I was actually so that if it, I believe it's the same the same event mm. um we were we were doing this this tour of Europe with Steve Gad Zildjian was doing this thing called um uh, Mission from Gad mm -hmm. and we were going to all these European cities and we right. were in Paris for a few days and I I planned it that way so that I knew that Charlie was there with the Boogie Woogie band in mm. Paris and mm. and so we we went to the gig and um uh, my wife was with me, uh, the Steve's tech yard, Gavrilovich, and uh, two of my colleagues from Zildjian were there. And and I just remember Charlie being a little bit nervous because Steve was there. He knew Steve was coming and we went and saw him before the show. And, mm. and he, you know, he'd always give me the sort of, the sort of not stink eye, but like, and he'd say, like, why do you, why do you bring all these drummers to see me? You know, like, why do you, you know, I brought Peter Erskine, this, you know, renowned jazz drummer to yeah. Ronnie Scott's in yeah. 2004 when Peter was in London while I was there. And, and he, you know, it was like, what'd you, what'd you have to bring him for? You know, I'm glad you're here, but why is he here? But, I know. Yeah. Um, I mean, he, he, yeah. he, he was, um, I, I, I always felt that there was a lot of 
a lot of hero worship by him, you know, to his his own jazz yeah. uh, favorites. I remember him telling me about meeting Chico Hamilton, you know, and he couldn't he, just, he could not believe it. This is somebody he'd been listening to since he was a kid, really, you know, yeah, and, and admiring yeah. from afar. And then they not only did they uh, meet, but they actually recorded together, you know, and uh, amazing experience for, for that's Charlie. that's so he never great. lost that humble quality, which is so endearing and so rare, you know, to 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 have that. As you said before, you know that that level of humility—it's quite yeah, pretty unique. I mean. And he, you know, he really seemed to, um, in later years, um, really embrace the idea of being. Uh, you know, I think for it seemed to me anyway for a long time he sort of didn't interact with a lot of these, even though they were some were his heroes. I think he just mm -hmm. sort of kept to himself. But I think he really like when when they'd come to New York to do a premiere, for example, for example, he'd he'd call Chico Hamilton, he'd call Roy Haynes, or he'd ask me to contact some of the New York drummers to come to the premiere. And mm -hmm. and I thought that was great ab about him. Yeah. You know, he he was um, inviting them to shows and red That's carpet fine. treatment and all that stuff. Yes, exactly. Know? And I think you're right. He did get more sort of uh, confident uh, about that as as he went on and he became, um, I suppose, you know, as, as often happens as he got older, he, you know, he developed that really sort of avuncular quality, didn't he? Um, yeah. You know, it's, yeah. It's, 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 it's partly a visual thing, you know, so he went gray and then it went silver, you know, and um, his daughter, his granddaughter, Charlotte had a lovely phrase, which I made, made the most of in the book, which was that he had grandpa energy. Which, yes. And yeah. She, said, she yeah. said that he had that even when he was younger. You know, I mean, uh, that was just something that was that was that was in him, I think, you know, so that was really nice. Yeah, I, I you know, I've, I've met Charlotte a few times and um, the the, you know, like I'd, I'd be sitting in his in his dressing room before a show and Charlotte yeah. would come in and he, you know, the this it was just I'm going to get teary eyed thinking about it because the love they have for yeah. each other was just so beautiful. It's just, incredible. Yeah. And um, oh, you know, th this was something, you know, I can't say state t too strongly how, how wonderful his family have been to me, you know, and in, in the creating of the, of the book, because this is an important point, you know, as much as I was well known, I guess, within the stones organization and, uh, and, and with the band, um, I'd never met his, his family and, mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously there are people who can kind of <laughs> vouch for what you do, but really you, again, it's a question of sort of proving yourself or, or maybe selling yourself a little bit. And they were so warm and so um, giving with, with the time and, and, and their memories and so on. And this is, you know, the, they are, as a family, they're, incre as you know, I mean, they're incredibly private, you know, every bit yeah. as much as Charlie was. So for them to open up to me for that and then to, to give the, 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 the uh, the approval, which I was the thing I I wanted and needed to have, you know, to make it an official yeah. book, um, was was really something. And um, just the stories that flowed back and forth between you know other people in, in on the team who knew knew him and the family over the years. Tony King, a very important guy, whose whose own book is just out by the way for anybody who wants an amazing story oh, great. about the entire history of pop and rock really um because Tony <laughs> is uh, one of the true characters of this business and um you know pretty much contemporary of, of the stones so and he knew them and he knew charlie and uh and shirley you know very early on um yeah so he had some some lovely uh stories about um you know how charlie would uh, would would just when um shirley came on the tours occasionally which she did from time to time you know he would just kind of light up and, and be be so much happier and then the same thing would happen with Serafina when she started coming out his daughter um and then the same thing again with Charlotte which is one of those things that just emphasizes yet again the incredible sort of generational quality you know multi-generational nature of yeah. the band you know you've got literally generations of people sort of following each other into these roles and um uh yeah uh, Don had a lovely story about uh, I think one of the last times that Shirley did come out you know to see to see Charlie or to see the band and to see Charlie play. And, uh, you know, he just said, uh, he, he, he was just so happy and he said he couldn't, he couldn't take his eyes off her, which is just the sweetest thing uh, ever, isn't it? <laughs> it sure is. Yeah. It's just, yeah. Amazing. So beautiful. And, and, you know, there's like, as you say, there's so many, um, great stories and quotes in there from Tony. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, I wondered there's one where he, he, <laughs> <laughs> I wondered if if he's talking about him and Charlie are he's they're at a at a show and a friend comes to see Charlie and 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 it, I think you quoted it as saying 
uh, or maybe Tony said something like, Charlie obviously liked this person. He was a friend or something. Right. And then when the person left, he said, lovely guy, shame about his shoes. <laughs> and I thought, he, I wonder if he was talking about me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm because, sure he wasn't. I'm sure he wasn't. Uh, I don't know. I, yeah. I, I would think it's the funniest thing because I always, you know, when I got to know Charlie, I, I was always self-conscious about like, wearing the right jacket yes the right that's right shirt. yeah you're, you're yeah. right and and i i never really probably had the right shoes even when i spent some money on some what i thought decent shoes you yes, know I mean? well, we're talking yeah, about not, charlie not all of us had quite the uh, the sort of spare cash to spend <laughs> not that he would it, 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 as, <laughs> as you know i spoke to his, his tailor and his shoemaker for the book so that was that was important when he mentioned tony i thought you were going to um say the other one of my favorite stories in the book and again it was from tony king was um uh, you know, because he knew them so well and, and had and saw the whole evolution of this band right the way, you know, from from the early days onwards um, and just saw the craziness and how everything just completely exploded, you know. And uh, uh, he he sort of, we were talking about Charlie's modesty and he agreed, he agreed with that, but he said there were times where he could get a little, you know, a, a little um, full of himself perhaps. And uh, he, he told the story about uh, um, him coming home this was probably around the late 60s i think uh you know shirley charlie's wife told yeah. Tony, um i think probably in a letter in the way that people used to write letters in those days um yeah she said charlie came home the other day all full of himself about me being a member of the rolling stones so i made him clean the oven <laughs> Just... <laughs> <laughs> made him... My favorite story, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I can I can picture it too. I know. I know. Oh my God! Yeah, that's yeah, too... that's right. Yeah, uh, I know. Yeah. So he <laughs> was, as we know, he was a he was a very domesticated guy. Um, yeah, you know, he'd get home from these ridiculously long tours, of course, in the old days, and and then I mean, within two days, he'd be under Shirley's feet, and she'd be telling him to go and do something else. <laughs> <laughs> it's time to go back to yeah, work. Exactly. Yeah, go back to work. Oh that's my right. God. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I know. Yeah, there were some exactly hilarious stories like that in there. That, and again, you know, only you could could, you know, get that sort of access to these people that to make this. And I and I, I wanted to talk about that too. The fact that, you know, I I think what's so great about this book, and I'll hold up the book again for everybody to see, is that it is an authorized. I mean, it's it's sanctioned by the family, mm. by his friends, by the members of the Rolling Stones. Mm. So you know, everything, every, it's, it's all true stories, you know, it's not some writer just kind of rehashing things that he's mm. heard and read and, mm. um, which is just, it's so great. It's so it's, great. Yeah. I guess. It, it, yeah. Thank you. I mean, it is kind of ho horse's mouth stuff, I yeah. think, you know, and, yeah. um, it, uh, it, we said it at the beginning, but, um, to, to be able to kind of top up all of this amazing experience, I've been so lucky, you know, to, to meet these guys and, and so many artists on, on that level. Um, to be able to sort of refresh that with with new material, and um, I mean, it's just sad the circumstances of it, of course. But uh, I think they seize the opportunity, you know, to sort of just to to, to explain to people um, how much they love this guy, you know. And um, Mick, yeah. in particular, I think you know some people have been um, surprised to find that you know, I mean, Mick can can sometimes come across as a little um, not lacking in emotion, but just. Um, he reins himself in quite quite strictly. I always think, you know, and and the 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 contribution that he made to to, to this book was so generous, and um, yeah. you know, far more. There's always going to be an element with any interview situation of just doing whatever is required, you know, and that and then that that may be it. Um, but he really went the extra distance um, on this, you know, because I know I could sense that he knew it was important, um, and that it would be seen, you know, as a, as um, as his own reaction to uh, to to his friends and how how much he misses him you know yeah well said i was i was going to comment comment on that as well that um i don't know that i've ever read anything with so much of mick um you know being a part of it something that's about mm -hmm. somebody else mm -hmm. you know and and, yes. and you know so generous and and keith as well and that's right yeah yeah i mean yeah. Mick is one of those people and I, i've noticed this a lot over over you know my many decades of, of interviewing uh, famous people is that um if you have and these opportunities are, are relatively rare because we're all doing you know our work and we're, we're talking about whatever the new project is um but if you do have the opportunity to talk to someone uh, uh, like that about someone else or a different subject 
those often are the best conversations, you know, because they're not on the clock. It's not the the regular kind of routine of pro promotional conversation. Um, I remember one time, another time, yes, another um, BBC radio uh, show that I, a documentary series that I was making about James Brown, um, and I knew I needed Mick for that um, because you know he was so hugely influenced by by him in every yeah. way. Um, and this was a long time ago, and it was in the days when you were actually still allowed, you know, from a sort of audio quality point of view, we still occasionally would run, would run things as a, as a phone, just a regular phone phone interview. Um, and they were on tour. You know, I mean, this is supposedly completely off limits. You know, you really it would be very rare for, to get the opportunity to, to talk to the Stones um, as a journalist uh, while they're actually on the road. Um, although I did do that again for this for this book, of course, but. Um, we yeah. had just the most brilliant conversation about about James Brown. He really opened up about how important he was and how he would still to this day would still listen to Live at the Apollo before he goes on stage just to get him in the in the zone, you know. Um, wow. And yeah. that ha that's how many times. I mean, Elton's another one of those. You know, you get talking about about old soul records with him and you know Garnet Mims or wherever, whoever it, Don Covey or someone, you know, and he's off. You know, and he's he's away. Yeah. Just yeah. And then you remember that these guys are just like anybody else, really, guys and girls. You know, they're just like anybody else, and they started out as massive music fans, and it's still there. You know, and they're still and they're yeah. still. If you catch them on the right at the right moment and you have the opportunity. Um, you could just have some wonderful conversations. Yeah. And, and the subject matter really resonates with them as well. And, mm -hmm. and as you say, in this case with, with it being Charlie, you know, Mick, I'm sure was more than forthcoming with them. And, and, and that's a good point that you make too, that because it's, it's, you started the book. I mean, the band was gearing up to tour for everybody mm -hmm. who doesn't remember. Um, Steve Jordan had been brought in to, to be a temporary yeah. uh, substitute until Charlie was well enough to join the tour mm. and and then we lost Charlie and then how how soon um did you kind of start writing the book well you know, I'll, Charlie... I'll tell you the just the sort of potted history of it John is is that um the initial discussions about the project were were while Charlie was still with us and and uh, briefly what happened and I'm I, again I feel so lucky because I, I was approached, and it wasn't a question of me going to, to a publisher with, with the idea. Um, uh, the guy who became my publisher at HarperCollins um, saw an a, a article that I'd written about the Stones for the Sunday Times, one of many again. Um, and I think it was probably around the time of the, uh, the, the Goat's Head Soup reissue. You know, they've done those, those many deluxe sort of repackages of, of some of the classic albums. Yes. Um, so I interviewed the whole band for uh, for that. Uh, not Charlie on, on that occasion. Um, he, he managed to get a, a, a day pass, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, away <laughs> for that one. Um, but uh, certainly the others. And I don't know if you remember that uh, Jimmy Page was um, was on one of those tracks that they they completed, the track Scar. Yes. Uh, so That's I interviewed right, him yeah. for it and wrote a feature um, which ran on the on the cover of the of the Sunday Times Culture section, and um, Joel, the, the 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 publisher, saw it and made contact with me, and uh, said, "We know we would very much like to do a project with Charlie." And I said, "Well, so would I, um, but only if it's approved." You know, having having worked closely with them for this amount of time, I wasn't going to do anything that was not didn't have um, some kind of seal of approval. Um, but yeah, the initial idea would have been for him he and i to work together on on his autobiography um and we did just you know we we developed that idea, idea for a while um and i don't think this is just with hindsight because i remember thinking even at the time that this this idea didn't it, it wasn't really sitting right with me because the fact is he would never mm. have done one you know um yeah just, uh, with, with all of the modesty that we that we've been talking about it's just something that would 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 never have um appealed to him um and actually, I think it would have been quite hard to do because of just how reticent he could be. And, you know, I mean, he had just from, mm -hmm. in terms of less so in, in, in a regular um, just conversation between two friends, but certainly in an interview situation, his his speech was often quite sort of staccato and he would he would hesitate in the middle of a sentence sometimes, you know. And I know that would have made made that project quite hard, even if he had wanted to, to you know, talk about himself, which he just never did. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, that idea idea sat there for, for a while. And I guess eventually, you know, he um, he, he was, I, I forget the exact chronology of it, but he was getting poorly. And um, by then the idea had sort of morphed into um, the the possibility of a, an approved biography. Um, 
I see. And that's what I, <clears throat> what I uh, uh, pursued, you know, and um, the actual, as always happens in the world of the, of the stones, it's, you know, it's, it's the classic sort of hurry up and wait <laughs> situation mm-hmm. and <laughs> an awful lot of talking about it. And then suddenly a deadline, you know, and a great, a great yeah. sort of, uh, panic <laughs> to, uh, to get it done. But in a way, I mean, you know, I'm no, I'm no good without a deadline anyway, like a lot of journalists. And um it sort of just focused the whole thing nicely in a way. And uh, I kind of got the band at the, at the pretty much the last possible moment that, that we, not, not the last possible moment, but they were already on the tour, you know, on the 60 tour. Um, yeah. And I had been thinking, well, this is going to get, this is going to be tough now, you know, but they they made it happen. And um, obviously, the, you know, all of the other pieces were in place by then. Um, yeah. And Mick and Keith were, were, were incredibly gracious to allow me to use parts of those conversations for the forwards. Um, which you know made the publisher very happy, of course. <laughs> and, sure. Uh, no, I yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, it's 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 all everything aligned, you know, mm. as I think as perfectly as it possibly could have. Really, right? I think so. I mean, yeah, and then there is. I mean, just from yeah. a very selfish point of view, you, all the time you're working on it, you're thinking, I really hope nobody else gets is doing this as well or gets to it first. But then I knew that they would not have that level of approval. You know, they're, they're, right. there have been one or two other, frankly, not very good books about about Charlie over the years, you know, but um, it is amazing that I don't think anyone had ever actually even um, attempted the idea of, of of this kind of a book, I suppose, because that is a reflection of just how how private he was and how, you know, access to him would be relatively uh, rare, you know. So, again, it's yeah. just, I, I just feel so privileged to have been in that position. Well, you know, I, I, an example of what you're talking about, we talked about the tribute to Ginger Baker mm. that we did in 2008. Yeah, and that's we right. You're in talked, the book talking about that. Yeah. 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 And, and uh, you know, I had talked to Charlie about doing it. And, uh, you know, initially he was open to discussing it, uh, but didn't give any sort of commitment to doing, to mm. being honored as we honor Ginger. Um, and we were talking to Ringo and the idea was, you know, Charlie, Ringo, Ginger, uh, and and Mitch Mitchell even possibly, but mm. those three, and R- Ringo and Charlie were doing like a little number on me where one would say, um, if Charlie does it, maybe Ringo would say, if if Charlie's going to do it, maybe I'll do it. Right. And, and Charlie would say, what's Ringo? Say? If Ringo's <laughs> thinking of doing it, and and ultimately, I think both of them were to your point, mm. not really comfortable, you know. And at first, I I I didn't quite understand it, but then I got it. I mean, I realized these are are you know um english gentlemen that mm. have have never really wanted to have a fuss made about them that's right um yeah and and charlie i i know much better knew much better than mm. ringo and i knew that was a, a as you say a real thing it was a sincere trait yes. about charlie was he he was not comfortable with all that sort of attention and no. but he was but i will say he he was i had asked him um would you come and come to the event if you're in town and present the award to ginger and mm. and he said i'll do that and mm. and 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 that was wonderful because it meant so much to ginger of course you know and it, it was a way for him to yes that's right yeah and didn't you tell me that he had a whole thing ready to say and then he kind of forgot it all and just said he he did word. yeah he <laughs> came up yeah and it was you know he came up on stage and of course the crowd went bananas when yeah. he walked on stage yeah. and he looked incredible in this you know, black suit with a white shirt. And I was wearing a sort of similar uh, black jacket, black mm. pants. I think I might have had a darker shirt. And I said, I said something like when he got there, I said, Charlie, you, you look fantastic. And he said, can't go wrong with a black suit and a white <laughs> shirt. I mean, it was like, so, you know, yeah. he said, you know, you, you, it, it's never, you know, it never fails. It's, but yeah, that's but right. I will, yeah, I will say this and I, without making a I might have told you this story, Paul, when we were when we spoke the first time. But um, you know, Ginger was was having a bit of a tough time that night. You know, mm. he was he was having a lot of back pain, and and uh, you know, he was he was glad he was being honored. He was excited to be there. But it was a a, a diff- that moment just before the the event began was a little bit difficult. So I I got him to the venue, and Charlie was due to arrive at seven p.m. and mm. and Ginger was a little anxious and so we're sitting in his dressing room and then i had word that charlie was there so i met him at right at seven on the button brought him to ginger's dressing room and ginger was immediately at ease Mm. and the two chatted for an hour and in the dressing room and laughed and told stories and yeah and then when yeah and then when charlie at one point said 
I should go say hi to Jack Bruce and some of the other guys right. that, that are here. You know, I, I should go and I'll be back later or something. And Ginger turned to me and said, thanks, John. He mm -hmm. said, Charlie's a great guy. <laughs> you know, it was beautiful. It was That's beautiful because I was, yeah, it was, it was. Yeah, really I mean, it's, it's a that, fascinating relationship because, because as Nettie um, points out in, in the book, you know, you couldn't have two more different people. I mean, you know, she, she's very aware of her father's reputation, you know, and as uh, not always the sweetest uh, disposition <laughs> out there. And, and Charlie, yeah. you know, was the sweetest guy ever. So, you know, it's amazing that they, they they could have traveled along those sorts of parallel lines for all those decades, you know, and um, yeah, uh, but a funny relationship, you know, and Charlie one time said, um, you know, that uh, he, I guess he went to see, I think he went to the city, went to see Ginger on his, on his ranch or something and said, I'll give you tickets for, to come and see the, the gig. But I know you wouldn't come. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he's quite right. I know, I know. And Ginger probably said to him, "You know, you're right, Charlie. I won't." Exactly. You know, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yes, that's right. He wouldn't. I know. Be no politeness about it, you know, or pretending. Yeah. Right. Oh, you know, maybe I will. It was like, no, you're right. Uh, I'm, I'm not coming. <laughs> you know, I I will say I I knew Ginger, um, I'd say thirty years and uh, 1989. Right. You know, right up until he passed yeah. away in 2019, and. Um, he was always sweet to me. And even under circumstances where I know he was, you know, the, during that event, there were some moments and other times, you know, where we see each other and it was, you know, he might be pissed off at, I saw him at a club one time and he was pissed off at the sound guy, the monitor guy, but, but, you know, then he'd go, you know, thanks, you know, hi, John, yeah. you know, like he, but he would, he would find a way I, you know, I, I could never, I could never say that Ginger, uh, I ever had any bad no. moments with well, him. Well, I think, yeah. you know, that, that's your compliment, you know, it's in the same way that for me, it, it's, uh, you know, it may be a relatively small thing, but um, uh, it, it just proves you, you, you're doing something right. And I think he, he, Ginger is one of those people that clearly didn't suffer fools and, you know, yeah. again, did not like the interview situation, I'm sure. And boy, did he get asked some stupid questions, you know, so you can kind of understand, <laughs> if you're a little fiery of, of temperament, you can sort of understand why he would lose it sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. Yeah, he, he was. Um, and I and I, you know, as, as I said to you in the book, too, I think, you know, Ginger, I think he he respected Charlie. And I think he he respected the fact that Charlie was so respectful of him. Mm -hmm. You know, Charlie was so uh, genuinely complimentary and, and respectful yeah. of Ginger. And he made a point of saying it. And and that I want I think it went a long way for Ginger. To, yeah, I think so. to feel yeah. that and, respect. And, and also, you know, he, he, uh, you see this happen as well, don't you? That you know you have um, r friendships that have lasted that long, um, back to before the person was was well famous. You know, so and mm, this is the same thing right. with Dave Green. You know, they grew up together in the famously in the in the prefab housing in in Wembley. You know, from when they were uh, you know really just after the war. Um, so it's not a question of which does often happen doesn't it of um people just surrounding themselves with uh with yes men and women or or sick offense you know this is uh i think it i think it appealed to charlie the idea that he had these two and i'm sure there were others but those two particular close friends who'd been with him you know the whole way you know right. way way before anybody knew who he was you know that's and had never changed you know um, yeah yeah and had a similarly you know grounded view of of the world um, which is rare, isn't it? In our game. <laughs> it, it really is. Yeah. And, and I, and I exactly, and I took from that, especially with Dave, um, this, you know, not surprisingly, this tremendous loyalty that Charlie has, mm. for his old friends, you know, his, his, his first bandmate, you know, next door yeah. neighbor. Yeah. Um, and all these, you know, he's now in a position financially where he could, you know, basically, uh, you know, rent out Ronnie Scott's for a week yeah. and, and hire a band to come in and play and, that's right. and pay the band, you know, handsomely sure. and, and just, yeah, just, yeah, that's it. I mean, and it's, uh, you know, this, his generosity became such a recurring feature of all of the new interviews for the book and, and some of the old ones as well, you know, previous conversations um, that I made a chapter of it, you know, as, as you saw, I, I have a few um, little spin off chapters, which come away from the main sort of chronological narrative. Um, to, to sort of just throw a bit of light on other aspects of, of Charlie's life and, and character and his generosity 
is one of those, you know, because it's just re- so many stories about, you know, the amazing gifts and thoughtful presence that he would give to people. Um, so that was one. Um, his collections, of course, was a was a uh, a, a chapter, all all of its all of its own. Um, his his marriage, you know, to to Shirley lasted fifty seven years. You know, that's that's that was a chapter on its own. So. Um, and I called each each of those little little um, chapters was called was called backbeat. That was a sort of united mm-hmm. phrase for yeah. it because it was to, to take you just away for a little bit and then you come back to the main the main story. You know, because again, one of the things I said early on with the with this project was, I mean, you could probably imagine it, once people began to notice how many how many interviews I I was doing with with the Stones. A um, long time ago, you know, would have been the first time somebody said, you know, why don't you do a book? And I always said, well, no, the world doesn't need yet another book on the Rolling Stone. You know, there are <laughs> probably thousands of them, actually. Um, mm. And I kind of stayed stayed true to that until this very specific um, opportunity came around, you know. Uh, and I didn't want it to be another history of, of the band. It, it's kind of it. The, the Stones are obviously a constant part of the story. Um, but I would hope that it's the stones through his eyes, really, you know, and then it's not just that, of course, it's, it's, uh, every other aspect of, of, of his life, uh, of which the stones was an important part, but certainly not the only part, you know? Yeah, <clears throat> exactly. And I, and I, I, I'd be remiss to not mention, um, it's so great that, that Bill Wyman was such a, a big contributor yeah. as well. And, and, uh, you know, not enough, I feel like there's just not enough said about Bill Sure. and there's a great uh quote in there i i guess that if i remember this correctly that bill relates to you that charlie said to him mm-hmm. charlie rang him from south america one time yeah. after a gig in the <laughs> middle of the night or something and yeah. bill says where are you i'm in you, you know <laughs> bolivia <laughs> yes bonus aries or some, some mangled, <laughs> Bunis, aries, yeah. mangled and, he said that, so, <laughs> and he, he he said something like i was listening to some of the old records or something and you were you were you were a good bass player yeah. or something. <laughs> it's like it never occurred to him before or something. That's ridiculous. Oh, but actually, that does prove to you how, how rarely he played the records, you know? Right. Uh, I know. I remember I know. going out it's to just... interview them once, one time in, uh, I mean, this is the thing that, you know, especially getting, getting, having been doing this for, for so long, you know, some of the locations kind of blur together a little bit, um, but it would have been the beginning of, I think it might've been in, in, it wasn't one of the American trips. It might've been in, um, in Holland, I think actually on a European tour, um, uh, and there was a new set of reissues. It was, I think, this was, this was still in the C, very much the CD era, mm. um, and um, I just took copies of them out, you know, because I, I'd been given them, and I thought, you know, his the, these are old Abco sixties uh, reissues, and um, he just immediately started talking about bloody Alan Klein, you know, <laughs> <And so like, laughs> <laughs> bloody Alan Klein. Uh, uh, but of course if you give him We're a record still... and i did this once as well you know if you give him a record by somebody else one of his heroes then now you're talking you know this is a whole different story. yeah <laughs> oh that's yeah exactly i i um I, I don't know if when we spoke that that first time if i told you that story when we were talking you were talking about his his um his his shoemaker and his shirt mm. maker he he took me to both of them right um yeah, I think I told you that story. Yes, we had you did, but yeah, the but it, yeah. Re- re- worth retelling for sure. Well, it was, it, and it's, I, you know, it was, it was right up. It was about this time. It was March of two thousand eight, and I know this because I was in London for this event that we did every year, just before the big Frankfurt Music Mess mm-hmm. trade show they have, um, and that was that's typically in March, and uh, so I had a couple of days off between the event that I, that we had done and before I left for Frankfurt, and. We had lunch at uh, what I I can't remember the name of the place. I'm sure you know it in in Chelsea, mm-hmm. not far from his flat. We right. could, because we went there afterward. Yeah, but we had lunch with um, Sherry Daly mm-hmm. from the office, mm-hmm. um, and and then after that, Charlie said, "I have some errands to run. Do you know, what do you have to do now?" And I said, "I'm I'm free. I'm not doing mm-hmm. anything." So we walked up along um, along Hyde Park, yep. up to Piccadilly, and. And we went into the shoemaker and the yeah. shirt maker. And I've told this story on these on these shows before, but um, it was a surreal moment for me. And and just that, uh, you know, he he was letting me into this world that I was yeah. aware of, Paul. But but I would have never, as a as a teenager, <laughs> you know, worshiping my favorite drummer, would have never imagined I'd be. And we have, we're having this really great conversation about 
jazz drummers and and uh you know guys like gene krupa and mm. max roach and mm. and as we're walking along hyde park this man comes walking toward us uh probably somebody about my age you know at the time and and he comes walking and his eyes sort of kind of went like went wide and he went it's it's you <laughs> and charlie and charlie kind of nodded his head and said hi how are you and i think he might have shaken his hand and then we just kept walking and i thought <laughs> he did that so perfectly. He he acknowledged the guy. He yeah. didn't ignore him, but he but he just sort of kept going. You That's know, right. just sort of hi, you know, and kept going. And I I think he later said something like, "I I thought he was talking to you." And I, you know, <laughs> that was just the you know his humor. Yeah, then, it's a nice way of putting you at ease, though, isn't it? You know. Um, oh yeah. I suppose yeah. that you know, the, then, even though he would have cho not chosen to be in those sort of situations, being in that in that band for that long, you would have to develop some sort of mechanism to deal with that, wouldn't you? You know, otherwise you'd yeah. go mad. I think. And yeah, uh, you know, this exactly. is somebody who. Um, I, as people said to me, you know, and I saw it in action, you know, that until really the last few years, he would just walk out of the hotel on, on his own, no security, you know, and just, he was a great walker, wasn't he? And, you know, didn't yes. sleep too well. He'd go out in the middle of the night sometimes, you know, and um, just sort of wander <laughs> about. And, uh, it's, you know, he was so hilarious about technology as well. I'm sure you found that, you know, he, yes. he was, um, yeah. just hated it all really um he did there, there was one tour where he tour where he had a mobile phone i want to say it was 2006 right. because i i did have the number mm -hmm. and and i would call him and he would he would answer it oftentimes right and then he told me later that he would never do that again like he yeah people people kept calling him i know yeah when when, <laughs> when they came out you know when mobiles were fairly new i remember he said to me um he said, "I don't know. I don't know what Mick would do without a mobile. I cannot stand them. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they, they, they divided into two camps and stuff because Keith is a similar level of technophobia. Yeah. You know, Keith, who, who once said, yeah. I, I talk about computers.' He said, I don't do mice. <laughs> <laughs> I need mice. <laughs> Keith is one of the funniest. He's just people I've. I, I oh think my he, god, he yeah. is the most quotable." Um, uh, rock star i've ever ever met he's you know um the only other person that comes close from a completely different line of uh, world of music in terms of being utterly quotable uh, as in you can use pretty much every word they say um people may be surprised or people may may identify with this is dolly parton she's fantastic wow. you know she's just i made it i remember again making a radio show um with her one time um where uh you get your allotted time and this is frustrating with dolly because you can be you can be doing you can you know you're having a great chat but sh there is always the guy who comes in and does the you know the sort of um yeah time's up or it will be in one minute whatever you know and kind of stands there hovering over you you know for you to wind it up um but i did the interview came home and uh and the 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 uh commissioning editor at the, at the bbc Said to me, "How did it go?" I said, "Great, fantastic." And he, he, we had slated it for a one-hour program. And when I told him how great it was, he said, "Great, let's do, let's do two hours." And you're thinking, "That's going to be really hard because I just haven't got enough stuff." But the beauty is, you know, half an hour with Dolly or Keith is like an hour with anybody else because there is no wastage. <laughs> there's nothing. There's no, you know, no fat there uh, whatsoever. Um, so uh, you, I, I literally kind of used every word. I think, you know. So yeah, yeah. yeah. I've, I had a couple of great quotes from Keith just in the few times that I met him. And mm. I remember at a, at a rehearsal, this would have been, you know, 20 years ago. And, mm. and uh, Charlie introduced me. I'd met him once before and he reintroduced me. So, you remember John from Zildjian? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and Keith said, Zildjian, heavy duty Turkish works. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I wrote it down. It was just you know, heavy. Oh yeah, heavy duty Turkish oh, works. And then amazing. the the um, this would have been ten years ago when they were at the um, just ahead of the fifty and counting tour. Mm -hmm. When I I just left my post at Zildjian, I went down to, to the show and I was with Charlie and Max Weinberg and uh, and Keith came over and and they were chatting. And again, Charlie introduced me and I said mm -hmm. this was December of of twenty twelve. And I said. Um, happy early birthday. I said, we actually share the same birthday, December right. 18th. And he, and his eyes kind of, he went, he said, you and me and Bobby Keys. Bobby Keys, said, that's right. Yeah. And he said, Sagittarius, half man, half horse, <laughs> licensed to shit on the street. <laughs> <laughs> again uh, and I'd, I'd read that or heard that in other places where he had said that but yeah. I, I got it you know he, it's he, just wonderful isn't it he's incapable yeah, of saying anything just... boring that uh, <laughs> just, 
you know, it's a love of language, actually. It's, it, it's, people yeah. don't make enough of this with, with him, you know, because there's still, there, I, some of this has been dispelled now, thank goodness, but there are still people who think, you know, just have kind of bought the, 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 legend or the the caricature or whatever you know and don't realize what an incredibly intelligent and well-read oh. man keith is you know um charlie as well Absolutely. actually you know, they all are um yeah and how uh you know he just even if he's telling you something relatively mundane he'll say in an incredibly entertaining way you know yeah um well the, you know the the end of that the story of of me spending that day with him on piccadilly and, mm. at um uh Oh gosh, the two uh, Burlington Arcade right. and the other. Um, yes, um, yes, Abel Row. Yeah, yeah, so so we so it's the it's a, like four in the afternoon, and he, he's like, so you know, do you have to be anywhere now? And I said, mm. no, I'm Charlie. I'm just up the road on Regent Street, mm -hmm. you know. And and uh, he said, well, you know, how about a, how about a coffee? And I said, great. Mm. And there's like a Starbucks up ahead, and we went. No, nah, we don't want to go to Starbucks. Right. And we had walked by the Woolsey earlier. And he had commented that they were going to be celebrating Serafina's 40th birthday there yeah. um, in, a, in a couple of weeks. Oh, my producer's oh, joined the conversation, by the way. So, yes. Yeah, so, I mean, is, he, is he giving, is he giving me the one minute? <laughs> yeah, he's, doing the, he's doing the dolly thing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so so we, we, we walk inside the, the, uh, the Woolsey and, and it's like a Friday afternoon and I'm thinking it's four o'clock, it's going to be empty, you know, and the yeah. place is just packed, mobbed. Right. And uh, so we walk up to the hostess and Charlie says, you know, two for tea. Mm. And this young woman says, um, it's going to, it's about a 30 minute wait. And we both, I kind of thought, well, okay, it's been a fun day. I guess it's over now. We turn around to leave mm. and this gentleman comes out of nowhere right. and takes us both by the shoulders, like right this way, gentlemen, you know, and, <laughs> and, and magically a table appears. Yes. And Charlie turns to me and said, they must know who you are. <laughs> and, and it, it yeah, lovely, it was just, you know, yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. 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 Just a, a kind of old fashioned, um, it, it's good manners really, isn't it? Because it's sort of putting your, putting your guests at, at, at their ease, you know? Yeah. Lovely. He, he was so good at that. I, I, I just have to tell you one more funny thing that I, I know you'll appreciate knowing Charlie's humor. It was sometime after that I was, I was back in London and, my wife and I was on a Saturday and we were down at Portobello Road, which is, you know, we like to go there sometimes and mm. do a little shopping. And for people who don't know, it's a big outdoor shopping place. Market. Yeah. Uh, market. Yeah. Pretty raucous. Mm. So I, and, and Charlie, I, Charlie had said, um, you know, when you come to London, he'd always say, you know, ring me when you get here. And if I'm around, we can have lunch. So mm. I, I called him and I said, um, Charlie, I got into town, you know, last night, I'm here for a couple of days if you know maybe we can grab lunch and he, he could hear all the noise and he said where are you and i said oh i'm at portobello road he said oh god i hope you get out alive <laughs> yeah I, I still i still laugh to this day at that <laughs> yeah probably not his sort of thing although actually the stuff you know in terms of um collectibles that would have been up his very much up his street but uh, yeah would have wanted something yeah. a bit more private wouldn't he <laughs> yeah i could i could picture him you know thinking of this crowded place with yeah. people you know buying these trinkets and him going oh god you know that's but, right yeah yeah i mean yeah, i suppose in yeah. later years he had people to um to to look out for things for him you know and lots of good stories about that um yeah, uh, yeah you know and finding very specific things for particular people you know uh for, for birthdays and christmas and so on um bill had some lovely stories about that you know about the amazingly expensive presents that charlie used to buy him in the years after Bill had left the, the the Stones, you know, and Charlie um, would always say that he felt he felt sorry for for Bill that he never really made the big money that they that they they all went on to make, you know, in the in the yeah. real sort of stadium years. Um, but uh, you know, Bill knew when it was time to leave, he just uh, he he wanted to do other things, you know, and uh, and and then here would come Charlie with these incredible sort of Christmas presents or whatever, you know, sort of. Uh, uh, prehistoric uh, finds that he would. I know, extraordinary stuff. That was beautiful. When I read that, I, you know, and it, it was so great for me being a lifelong Stones fan, mm. life, lifelong Charlie fan to, to discover things in this book that I, I think I'll, I'll bet a lot of people don't know. And, and no, I mean, people have been very about. kind about yeah. that. And, and that has been a recurring um, comment, you know, that uh, people who thought they knew a, a lot about the Stones, um, that it's surprising how a lot of these things have never really been reported about uh, Charlie. They're just little quirks of his character aren't they you know they're they're, they're yeah. not controversial in any way but they are often very endearing i think and give you i hope give you a, a, a you know more of a 
a rounded picture of him as a as a human being rather than just a, a sort of drum drum drumming figurehead you know which obviously he was as well yeah yeah i you know and i'll, I'll just say that um you know on a personal note i i i never even thought as a kid i'd ever have the chance to meet him you know i, mm. I dreamed of meeting him as a kid and you know they they say you know the old expression never meet your heroes yeah. but you know i mean it, it's it's charlie was the uh you know just the the kindest nicest greatest person you know absolutely put him couldn't, right up there with yeah yeah couldn't agree more and i think you know it's a it's a again that there is a, a compliment in there for for anyone who, who who got close to him because these kind of guys they're so used to hero worship you know and they're so used to people just completely losing it when they are in front of them um if you a lot of it is to do with just just keep calm uh, carry on you know and just <laughs> yes yes be, be sensible and treat them as normal you know normal people normal in inverted commas and um that's what appeals to to someone like charlie i think you know is that's what he yeah what, what he was really looking for you know in his friend yeah yeah i i exactly and i'm glad i've said this before too i'm, I'm glad i met him when i was older and a little more yeah established in my in my uh professional life then if i'd met him when i was younger i yeah <laughs> he would have been that guy that, that, yeah i would have been that guy that would have been yeah. it for me but <laughs> but um yeah but i i also paul i want to just um you know i just want to say that this uh i think this book is great for really understanding and you know we've talked about this too but really kind of understanding so much about Charlie that I think for a lot of people, they don't, you know, they'll never know about him. Mm. Um, you know, his, his jazz roots, I think have been talked about, but I mean, you, sure. you get really deep into that as well too, which is great. Yes. I mean, it's, um, it, again, this is an invaluable thing of uh, being able to talk to his family, you know, who, um, it, it's so beautifully down to earth. Um, and they, you know, Serafina and, and Charlotte, they're both aware that Charlie was a, you know, he was an unusual man in in many ways. Um, and there was no suggestion of sort of glossing it over or trying to sort of pretend that he was something that he wasn't. And a lot of the time that's, it came out in just these very funny stories. You know, you mentioned Bill and, you know, his, his great thing from, and we, we, we've met many times before, but, uh, you know, this is obviously a very different sort of a conversation. And he said to me that he identified, you know, he and Charlie became great friends very quickly, not just because they were beginning the process of becoming this incredible rhythm section, but because they were both OCD, you know, they had the same sort of mm. obsessive <laughs> um, tendencies. Um, yes. And, yeah. you know, and that does come out in some of Bill's stories and also, you know, Charlotte's and the hilarious things she said about, um, <laughs> you know, you'd be out on a country, uh, out with him for a country walk. You know, and then you suddenly find that he was kind of a quarter of a mile further back because he was tidying all the twigs onto the side of the verge, you know, and <laughs> like, really obsessive, oh, yeah. but in a very endearing kind of way, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I at, mean, Christ at so Christmas many... time, you know, a, p a piece of wrapping paper would never even barely make it to the floor because he'd be there picking it up and tidying it away. <laughs> and and her messing with his socks and his yeah, the socks. And, oh god, yeah. Welcome all those things and Rub beside anybody yeah. who messes with Charlie's socks. <laughs> No, I, you've done an amazing job. And also, I was going to mention, I, I started to say, too, the his jazz background and that you were able to speak mm. with his sister, too, and really yes. get that that yeah. firsthand account of, like, you know, young Charlie. That's right, I, yes. I had never, you know, read so much information about him as a as a young person. No, that's right. And and thank you for, for, for mentioning it, because Linda, uh, I mean, again, a, a, a lovely... A lovely thing that happened was that um you know she that she i mean a lot of people she's so low profile a lot of people don't even realize that charlie had a sister um yeah. and she had never spoken to the press about him ever this is the first and she's uh three years younger than than, than charlie um so this was the first and i went up to see her and her husband um a little about an hour hour and a half drive out of, out of town and um you know i could tell uh, quite understandably we'd spoken on the phone and they'd agreed to see me but, you know, I could tell they were nervous. You know, they were, they have no idea who I was. I mean, they just maybe had heard something about me or the fact that I was, you know, had connections with the Stones or whatever. Um, but they didn't have to do that, you know, and they were, again, they were incredibly generous and and very, the thing, really important thing to remember, I, I found all the way through, is it's all very well for, for someone like me to come in and say, right, tell me your memories, you know, here, give me all the good stuff. And you think, yeah, we lost one of our favourite um stars artists musicians but they lost a brother or a, a father or grandfather 
you know, and it was all still very raw at that time, you know, so to, to for them to give me that access just from that point of view alone was was quite something. And she did. Yeah, you're right. She she talked about those um, those early years, you know, living in the prefab in in yeah. a tiny little place uh, in, in Wembley and um, how what a humble upbringing that was, you know, and yet he, absolutely. He remained yeah. for all of his wealth and taste. Uh, he, um, he, he, he never, he, I don't think he changed as a person at all. You know, he was, as, it was as a matter of fact and down to earth at the very end as he was, uh, you know, as a young man. And that's, absolutely, that's, that's yeah. a rare thing. It sure is. I, that's exactly how I would put it too. I mean, it, it's, he, he never forgot about his humble beginnings and, no. and certainly didn't flaunt his, um, no, that's right. Didn't assume anything either. Um, I don't even remember there was a point where he, uh, I tell a story about somebody, um, just a, a a fan who wrote him a letter, uh, inviting him to a to an event or their gig or something, and he wrote back. And it, the fact that he wrote back at all is amazing. But what I loved about that was he, he he finished the letter. You know, this is like they're at the height of their fame or whatever, and he finishes the letter by saying, "Yours truly, Charlie Watts, drummer, Rolling Stones," <laughs> as if as if we didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I know. Uh brilliant oh man i the best you know best. as he said about ginger i'll say about him the right. best yeah yeah uh, i'm with you all the way on that one yeah yeah well wow. paul thank you so much for being here today this is uh, my great pleasure uh, it's been my pleasure and, and an honor to have you here today and and everybody we, we had a lot of folks watching and commenting and uh right and really positive so many people are saying they love the book and and oh that's you know, lovely sir no yeah and, and, uh, and I forgot to say great. Uh, forgot to say great T-shirt. By the way, I hope somebody's picked up on that. Cause it's, uh... <laughs> yeah, I, before I brought you on, a, a few folks noticed this, and and uh, yeah. I, I do wear I wear this on gigs to yeah. bring me luck. You know, it's, <laughs> it's yeah. I um I I just I'll tell one last funny thing. I, I might have told you this as well when I I'd taken an absence from playing drums for a while, and I got into this band, and I remember calling Charlie to ask him because my band was playing uh, painted black and I called to say, um, Charlie, you know, I have a question about <laughs> painted black. And I said, and I, you know, I was that guy for a second. I said, yeah. are you playing quarter notes or eighth notes in the Tom Tom? I said, I'm just having a hard time getting the feel. And he just, he went, he laughed. He said, Oh, John, that's, it's so simple. You know, you can play, anyone can play that. He said, just don't play it too fast. <laughs> and I just thought that was, you know, this, you know, Typical Charlie. Typical you know, Charlie. Oh, playing, it, yeah, yeah, playing it down always. Yeah, anyone can do it. It's yeah, nothing. There's nothing. I'm not to doing it. anything special, you know. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Oh. Well, Paul, thank you. If you if you just hang with me for one second, we'll sure. say goodbye in the room, but I'll I'll end the broadcast. Right. Everyone, thank you so much for watching, and thanks to my guest Paul Sexton, author of Charlie's Good Tonight on Harper Collins, and you can get this on Amazon and probably anywhere where where you get books. So please get it if you don't already have it. It's a fabulous book. You'll love it. I promise you.